So just so you know that the webinar is being recorded. I appreciate everyone being here. Hi, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be archived online. I am Dr. Craig Ingstrom. I am an associate professor of business communication at Southern Illinois University Carbondale and current co-chair of National Communication Association's Talent Development Division. We have been hosting Training the Trainer webinars since 2018, and this is the fifth webinar in the series. The next will be on Tuesday, October 15th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and you will get notification of this if you're part of the mailing list. I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Best Practices for Delivering an Effective Conference Presentation, which is part of an ongoing effort by the NCA Training and Development Division Blue Ribbon Task Force. The goal of this task force is to make conference presentations at NCA or any conference more engaging and dynamic. Today, we have two communication experts who will share with us their insights and tips from the perspective of veteran consultants and coaches. Dr. Stephen Cohen is an associate professor and the faculty director for the business, for business communication at the Johns Hopkins Carey Business School. He is an accomplished scholar and dynamic trainer who has brought research-based insights to companies in a wide range of industries. Dr. Cohen is well known for helping professionals speak with authority and confidence. He has been quoted in media outlets such as the Financial Times, Slate, Huffington Post, Inc., New York Magazine, and NBC News. Dr. Cohen holds a PhD in communication from the University of Maryland, a master's degree in public policy from Harvard University, and a Bachelor of Arts in Business Administration, summa cum laude, from the University of Florida. Our second presenter is Professor Lisa A. Waits. She teaches undergraduate communication courses and executive development communication and leadership courses at the Start campus at Kent State University. She specializes in speech coaching, speech writing, and works with students and executives to manage performance phobias for nearly three decades. She teaches high impact professional speaking to undergraduate and corporate audiences. And some of her clients include FedEx, Xerox, Anheuser-Busch, Goodyear Tire, Heinz Corporation, PepsiCo, and the United States Air Force. I'm excited to hear from these experts. I'm very proud of the work that NCA Training and Development does, and you can learn more about the division and our upcoming conferences and webinars and see an archived recording of this webinar at natcom-td.org. At this time, I'd like to get a pulse of the folks that we have in the room. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, share a series of polls. If you would take a moment to respond to them, and then we can sort of uh, thematize them so that Stephen and Lisa will know what they're, uh, who they're sort of speaking to. Uh, and I'm actually having an error at this time. Give me one second, maybe it's not letting me launch the poll. So let me try again. Unfortunately, there will not be a poll today because of a technical error, but I do have a question that we can respond to. So the question that we have, and we'd like you to respond to these in the chat uh, room. If you need to find the chat, it should be at the bottom of your screen, or you might find it at the top of the screen as well. Uh, please answer this question to the best of your abilities. And uh, any questions you might have as the webinar is going, feel free to add them because I know our presenters are eager to answer questions along the way and at the end of the presentation. So the final question I have for you, and we'd like you to again, put it in the comments section is as follows. What is your best piece of advice for an NCA presenter or any conference presenter? So what is your best piece of advice for any NCA presenter? Please type your response in the comments area. All right, so we have prepare and practice. Lots of practice, practice, practice. Don't read off the slides, but look at the audience. So I guess, you know, don't read off your slides, but don't look at the, the ceiling as well. Give three points that give value to the audience, good. All right, so go ahead and feel free to keep responding to this question. And as this uh, webinar continues, feel free to write your comments at any time in that area so that Stephen or Lisa can attend to them. At this time, I'm going to pass the presentation along to Dr. Stephen Cohen. Thanks, Craig, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us at today's webinar. I'm really excited to be here and to get us started by talking about public speaking 
anxiety or PSA as it's commonly referred to in the literature. Now PSA is essentially stage, stage fright that comes from worry or uncertainty about what might happen during a presentation. We all face it. It's very normal and an everyday part of both conversations and presentations. And so I wanna spend a few minutes at the outset talking about some of the common causes of PSA and also share some concrete strategies that we can use to overcome our fear and speak with authority and confidence. Next slide, Craig, if you don't mind. Let's talk a little bit about the fear of public speaking and where it comes from. So this notion of stage fright, this fear stems from two primary sources, personality and uncertainty. Let's start with personality. Personality has to do with how comfortable we feel in social situations. Now, some of us are more introverted and others of us are more extroverted. Also, some of us are more or less predisposed to be comfortable in social or public speaking situations. There's little we can do to change personality. What we can change is uncertainty. Now, uncertainty refers to what might happen while we are speaking. We worry we might start sweating profusely. We're worried we might flub a line. We worry that the audience is judging us or won't take us seriously. And while these are valid concerns, they're highly unlikely to happen. In fact, most of what we worry about never comes to pass. Yet we consume a huge amount of time worrying about what might happen while we're on stage. This is uncertainty. And so it's so important that we push these negative feelings as, as we were commonly referred to it as negative self-talk to the side and focus instead on the impact that we can have on the audience and the difference we can make to the people in front of us. Next slide. And Craig, if you wouldn't mind muting the line, sounds like there's a little background noise and I wanna make sure folks can hear and are ready to participate as we talk about these next ideas, which is how to overcome our fears. Now, I thought it might be fun to be interactive. And so let's start with some techniques that we can try and, and learn about and use right now. What I want us to do in the chat box, if everyone wouldn't mind, is to write down what you're worried about when it comes to public speaking. What are your specific mental roadblocks? That is, what are you afraid of when it comes to public speaking? Let's take a moment and share a few of those fears in the chat box. So far we have one that says, I don't have something interesting to say or people will think that and it looks like the rest of the comment was cut off, but probably along the lines of people will think that I'm, I don't know what I'm talking about. Veronica says, being challenged by someone in the audience or not knowing as much as the audience. Lisa says, not knowing how to answer a complicated question about SPSS or how to deal with quantitative questions. Good. Rachel chimes in and says, they will not find my presentation interesting. Yes, certainly a, a common worry as well. And these are just some of the fears that we face. In fact, I often like folks to generate a long list of mental roadblocks so that we can focus specifically on what people are afraid of and what we need to do something about. If we just say we're afraid of public speaking, then there's fewer techniques that we can use to overcome them. But if we identify specifically what we're afraid of, then we can offer targeted mechanisms or techniques to help avert those worries from taking over during a presentation. So we wanna focus on what we're afraid of, and then we can do something about it, either through cognitive behavioral therapy or other techniques. The second thing we can do is stand like a superhero. Amy Cuddy popularized this idea, this notion of power posing in her top 10 TED talk. Amy Cuddy, until recently a professor at Harvard Business School, 
writes and speaks about warmth and competence and the importance of nonverbal communication. And power posing is a technique that I often teach to help folks overcome this fear. So I want everyone to try it. You're gonna stand up with me. I'm standing up right now. And place your feet about shoulder length apart. And then you wanna simply put your hands on your hips. And this is basically standing like a superhero. Lisa says, yeah, I am standing too. I love it. And Pui says, I'm introverted too. And this works great for introverts and frankly for anyone. In fact, if you're introverted, by the way, there's a great book out there that I'll get to a little later, but it's called Quiet and it's by Susan Cain. And Cain's book is basically about being introverted in an extroverted world. So Pui, do take a look at that but back to standing like a superhero. So if we stand like this for two minutes, Cuddy argues, then that will have, in her research at least, she found statistically significant differences in adrenaline and cortisol levels. Now I have to footnote that finding by saying that there were some questions around reproducibility. And so although she and others have backed off a little bit on those statistically significant findings, I still teach it because many people self-report feeling much more confident. So as I often tell my students, if this works for you, then certainly try it. Stand like this for two minutes before a high stakes presentation. Do it in the restroom, in your office, in a private part, uh, excuse me, a private location so that you can feel confident when you step out in front of a group of people. Let's move on to the third technique. And this has to do with breathing exercises. Now, there are many different types of breathing exercises that we can use, and there's a lot of research that supports or establishes a link between using breathing exercises and feeling more calm or relaxed before an important presentation. I want to teach one called four, seven, eight. How this works is we breathe in for four, hold for seven, and release for eight. So again, we're gonna try this together in a minute, but we're essentially creating or building up and alleviating tension. So we're gonna open our mouth and take a nice deep breath in in just a moment. Hold for a count of, four, excuse me, breathe in for a count of four. Hold our breath for a count of seven, and then slowly exhale for a count of eight. All right, you ready to try it? Let's all do it together. Everyone take a nice deep breath in. Ready, go. Hold. Exhale. Good. That's four, seven, eight. And if you like that one, write it down. It works wonderfully before an important presentation. And by the way, it's also a great technique if you have trouble getting to sleep. I recommend this technique as well as a nice way to calm ourselves down after a long day. The last thing we can do is to get comfortable at the venue. One of the reasons we get worried and all rallied up, if you will, before an important presentation is because we're not comfortable in the space. And so whenever possible, I take my clients to the presentation space and have them walk around and tell themselves that they're going to succeed. If we could practice at the venue, by getting there a few minutes early, perhaps the room is unlocked or you've gotten to the site a bit early, you can get comfortable in the room. And if that doesn't work, try a similar location, a similar auditorium or a conference room that's around the same size. And you don't have to practice your entire presentation. The parts you wanna practice are the opening, the closing, and any complex parts. You wanna practice the opening because of a phenomenon called primacy. Primacy is the idea that audiences tend to remember and put a lot of weight onto what they hear first. Similarly, you want to practice any complex parts because that's where you're more likely to fall down or stumble. And you can impress an audience if you can articulate those concepts smoothly. Finally, we want to end with power and practice the closing due to a phenomenon called recency. And recency is the idea that audiences tend to remember or put a lot of weight onto what they hear last. Hence the common statistical term, recency bias. So those are the pieces that we wanna practice at the venue or a similar location. The opening, any complex parts, and the closing. 
But I think in summary, if we use the four techniques on screen and we really give them a try and experiment with them, we will feel a lot more confident. And it's worth pointing out, by the way, that in the past, scholars argued, or, or at least, I don't know if scholars argued, but certainly I might say there was a lot of discussion in the communication community about the fact that we want to get rid of public speaking anxiety. That is, we want to suppress it, that it's a bad thing. But recent scholarship suggests just the opposite, that actually we don't want to get rid of it at all, that we want to harness it and use it to launch into a strong opening. So instead of trying to suppress or get rid of feelings of public speaking, use them and get excited about your presentation. Maybe that means being a little louder when you say good morning or good afternoon, or delivering your first lines with some more energy. Speaking or approaching public speaking anxiety in that way can make you a much more successful presenter. Next slide, Karen. Let me share one more concept today, and that's around entering the room like a leader. Now, I've been working with executives and politicians and government officials for over a decade. And one of the things I often notice with these clients is even if they have a big title, they often have fear, just like you or me. And so I want to help them establish confidence and influence so that when they walk into a room, they're taken seriously. Now, according to social psychologists, first impressions are formed in a part of the brain called the adaptive unconscious. The adaptive unconscious is the part of the brain where we quickly and quietly process large amounts of data. And this helps establish what psychologists call thin slicing. Thin slicing is basically another word for first impressions. And the reason it's called thin slicing is because humans make judgments based on thin slices of information. And so we take what we see and we compare it to similar experiences or people we've met. And that's how we decide whether we like someone or we don't whether we want to hire someone or whether we don't, whether we want to date someone or whether we don't, and frankly, what we think of someone in just a quick snap or matter of moments. So although we can't control what people think of us, we can manage it. And these next techniques on this slide is designed to help us enter the room like a leader and ensure that people thin slice us the way that we want to be thin sliced, that is, as a confident, competent leader. So the first thing you wanna do is walk through the door frame, walk through the door with confidence. And it's so important that we engage in positive self-talk. We wanna tell ourselves that we're gonna be successful. We wanna say, I'm gonna knock it out of the park. I'm gonna kick butt. What we don't wanna do is focus on the first line. And what we certainly don't wanna do is focus on, oh my gosh, I'm worried, I'm concerned. Are they gonna like me? Am I gonna do well? We wanna focus on positive self-talk and tell ourselves we're going to be successful and repeat that, especially as we enter the room and get ready to walk in front of the audience. The second step is, and this is important, to approach the speaking area like you're about to greet someone. What I mean is that you don't wanna stare at the audience as you're walking to the front of the room or getting up from your chair or from the panel to approach the lectern or walking from your seat in front of the PowerPoint slides. You want to focus on where you're going. And that's because of an idea called the looking listening ratio. The looking listening ratio is the idea that your audience spends time looking at you and checking you out before they're ready to listen to you. So you have to give the audience a chance to check you out. That means you can't look at the audience before you begin speaking because then they're not comfortable looking at you. And then when you start speaking, they'll be spending more time looking at you instead of listening to you. That's why you want to look where you're going, look straight ahead as you walk to the center of the stage and give your audience a chance to check you out. Now, I don't mean you need to extend your hand and pretend that you're actually shaking someone's hand. Instead, you just want to give them a chance to look at you, get comfortable with you, and get ready to listen to you. The next step is to plant your feet. This is really important because it enhances executive presence. Plant your feet before you begin speaking or as I like to say, plant, then pause. That means we don't wanna start speaking before our feet are planted. I know it can be awkward to have a little bit of silence, but here's a mantra I hope you'll remember and, and, and institute, and that is make your audience wait on you. Make your audience wait on you. We only wanna begin speaking when we're ready, and that enhances our executive presence, 
some of that silence creates anticipation and excitement. It shows the audience that we have something valuable to add. And so we want to plant our feet, pause for a moment, and then begin speaking. Which takes me to my final step, or our final step, which is to greet our audience. We want to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening. These are much more powerful openings than hi or hello. This is all about building executive presence, that it factor or that X factor that makes us stand out and that, frankly, makes people want to listen to us. And so if we follow these four steps, we'll be perceived as a leader. People will listen to us. People will take us seriously, and it will enhance our executive presence and our confidence. Let me say one last thing as we finish up this section. I think that these techniques are important. And you can go to the next slide, Craig, as I, as I turn this over in just a minute. As we think about our challenges as a presenter, what's most important is that if we push feelings of anxiety to the side and instead focus on executive presence, we can get people to trust us, follow us, and believe in, that, believe in us. With that, let me turn the presentation over to my wonderful colleague, Lisa Waite, who will talk about some of our challenges as presenters and how we can structure our presentations effectively. Lisa? Thank you, Stephen. Everyone, thanks for your time. We really value that. I have looked so forward to this all week. And we started the beginning of this process seeking a little bit of your advice that you could share and impart with one another. Now, we would like for you to take a moment and kind of type in what is your biggest challenge as a presenter. And while you do that, I would like to share a micro experience about one of my biggest challenges. And it has to do with technology. Specifically, there is something that I do not like about holding a handheld wired microphone. For me, it is like kryptonite to Superman. And I had to really think through and try to discern why is this bothering me? And I tend to be a very expressive person and I engage nonverbals appropriately and realized that holding a mic uh, almost seemed to feel like someone was tying my hand behind my back. Just, it just didn't work for me. So I talked to event planners and eventually learned to use one of those wireless lavalier microphones. And when you figure out what your um, kind of your challenges as a presenter, then and only then can you really begin to overcome it. So that is just one way. I see some of you are sharing not a lot of time to prepare for presentations, and that's true, not just in a conference sense, but also at work, in the workplace, when your supervisor comes up and says, tag, you're it, we need you, and you're kind of putting that together. Um, TikTok, making sure points are valuable for the audience, very relevant. Uh, I just want to comment there, too often I see presenters in a variety of contexts and they are really focused on their own needs and not the audience needs, that exigence that we always talk about. Um, I see again lack of insufficient time, um, choosing from possible illustrations or stories, that's a really good one, having the right narrative to share. So thank you for that and recall that you can submit questions at any time. So let's just stick with this for a moment. We see that challenges usually take the form of situations, what you've mentioned here. Specifically, we're talking about conferences. Um, I also see this challenge emerge in status differences. If your dean or your department chair is in the audience, I know sometimes that can uh, wreak havoc on nerves sharing and imparting new ideas. Sometimes presenters get a little bit nervous about how their new idea might be judged or evaluated. And certainly there's the overall skill set. I want to go back to something Stephen alluded to with regard to fear and the whole PSA. Fear in this, in this way that it's manifest is referred to as a re-motion, R-E, a re motion or what we call a remembered emotion because we are born with really two fears the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises everything else we learned 
So given a better understanding of some of these topics, I would like to offer a few brief management tips. The first is people really don't recognize your fear as much as you think they do. So for example, I can't feel your clammy hands or if you have a few of the butterflies, uh, sometimes we can see that people are a little bit flush, but otherwise it, it really doesn't resonate with us as much as you might think it does. And as um, public speaking anxiety, you have to remind yourself that you are in good company. We know how vast and such a, an experience it is for so many of us. The third would be experience is the best remedy. The more you do it, the more you do it, the better you become. And one illustration I often use, think about the first time someone ever took the training wheels off your bike and your handlebars were probably all over the place. It's because you were not in the habit of riding that bike. If I said today, I want you to write with your non-dominant hand, um, you probably don't do it as proficiently as you might want to because you're not in the habit. And sometimes we're not in the habit of conference speaking or public speaking. So experience is your friend. Before we move on, do any of you want to share your impression here of any of the comments that I've offered on this particular slide? Any challenges? I see choosing from possible illustrations or stories. That was, um, I believe, a previous comment. If you look at the graphic here, this is the idea I'm trying to illustrate. It's all about making that connection with the audience, the so what factor. So maybe you'll put some comments there and I'll come back to those. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to talk a little bit about platform skills. And Craig, if you would kindly put up the first bullet. Thank you. And that is to minimize reading. I want to be clear here. I want to be crystal clear that we are absolutely positively not out to shame any reader but instead to really help you become more natural in your delivery. We want you to have an energized presence and to be able to tell your research story and engage the audience to involve them at some level is even appropriate. This is, when I say this, conference presenting is different from classroom presenting or seminars or workshops. Um, so you really want to try to minimize your reading. I'll also add, that involving your listeners, it's not enough to simply read or to inform, but to draw them into the presentation in ways that it makes sense. And I know you have to watch that your time's not um, kind of diverted or, or a listener doesn't take you off on a tangent, but when it makes sense, when the time is right with discernment. All right, so let's go ahead to the next one, please. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the fact that people want new information. And what I tend to see happening at conferences among speakers at every level, brand new speakers and speakers who have been uh, veterans and they've been around a while, they're somewhat forgetting at times to create what we call information hunger. You want people to be really excited and you want to impart new information. Try to be clear and frame that in your message, draw that out, here's what's new. And when you think about the Apple CEO, Tim Cook, and even um, Steve Jobs, when they were about to launch a new iPhone, people wanted to know what's new. So imparting new information is important, creating that information hunger. That takes us to the ability to impart insight. And this is, although a small nuance, a skill that can really set apart experienced speakers from new speakers. This is a growth point. When I'm talking about imparting insight, here's what I mean. What can you do to be memorable? What can you do to be creative? What can you do to create the experience for them? And that's that big engagement piece. When I teach high impact speaking, I often advise folks to open big close bigger. So many speakers we know give attention to their opening technique and they might start with a startling statistic or a great quote, 
but like those little 4th of July sparklers, they have all that great fizz at the beginning and then they just kind of fizzle out. And I see presentations, they fall flat. So you wanna avoid that, leave people intrigued and leave them wanting to read your paper. How do you do that, you might wonder. Well, that's gonna take us to our next point. And this is by offering a one point impact. Define what you want your audience to know. What's the, I call it the so what factor at the end of your talk, what is it that you want them ultimately to walk away understanding or being able to realize more in a greater level um, as a result of your research and what you're sharing. And you can do this generally by imparting or sharing three key points. And I think it was Lisa Barley at the beginning of the program who even pointed that out. So Lisa, you earn high marks on that. Can we pause for a minute and can I get some feedback on how do you feel about this? Is it resonating with you? Is it making sense? Is there an idea or a main point that I've shared that maybe stands apart from the others? Give you a minute here to get that up there. The idea of learned fear is intriguing. It is pooey and what's interesting is um, if you look at a four or five year old perform, they have no fear. But by the time we get into first grade, second grade, third grade, and the ego is really starting to form and our peer associations are starting to form all of a sudden we have this realization of being judged and being evaluated so it truly is a learned behavior but just as it is learned we can learn to manage them and something else i'll throw in i never really say that we overcome these fully i think that's unrealistic if you ever see a session or a seminar to get rid of stage fright um, with all due respect to the presenter, every rhetorical situation is unique. So we learn to manage them. Uh, let's see some of the points. Presenting the fizzle out is so essential. Thank you, Courtney. I like the close bigger idea. Absolutely important to remember the presentation is not the final word. All right, very good. Well, let me show you some helpful hints. If we go to the next slide, I have what's called a message map. And I wanna give credit to Steve Jobs. This is what the late Steve Jobs used when he was preparing those big talks to reveal and unveil a new Apple product. Also when he was giving commencement and also corporate addresses. So this is a really neat way to summarize your idea. We see people, they're bringing their entire papers to the table. And I know if I have a manuscript in front of me, like anyone, I'm going to be tempted to read it. So this is certainly one way. It is not the only way, but it's, if it's helpful, I have already shared this with Craig. And if you're interested, we are happy to email a blank one to you. What this allows you to do is offer a summary of your conference presentation and you can connect the dots. What you wanna be able to do, and I'm gonna use kind of theater language, a theater metaphor, you want to be able to play the movie trailer and get people excited about your research, just like you sit in a movie and they play the trailer and it's a little preview and gives you some key uh, tones of, of what's to come. So play the movie trailer, not the entire film. I hope that makes sense. Um, as I said, this was used by Steve Jobs and I'm just offering some suggestions here. You can have a little bit of your headline, your one point impact, you have a couple of points, maybe some supporting material, and I'm even giving you an idea of what that might look like. You can have an introduction, your research question, your methodologies, and so on and so forth. But this would be very customized. It's a very personal message map, but it works. And I've used this with clients, with students, um, and at conferences on my own for years. And it's a really, really neat way to keep your ideas at the forefront and you're not tempted to read. So it allows you that engagement piece. Let's see, I'm looking here at some comments. It's gonna be posted great to the um, NATCOM, the TND website. Thank you, Pooey, for that. And again, many of you are reinforcing about the rule of three. So presentation etiquette, um, I, I just want to share a couple of the points that I think are most important, but also the ones I see people struggle with. First is arriving 10 minutes early. Stephen already mentioned this. Let me tell you what I do. 
as soon as I arrive to my conference hotel, whether it's NCA or any conference hotel, I go to my room, I check in, I go to my room, I drop off my suitcase, and I immediately go and I find my presentation room. And I do exactly what Steven suggested. I explore the speaker space. I take note of the lighting. I even note where the nearby restrooms are. So it might seem pretty obvious, but you'd be surprised how many speakers um, come kind of dashing in and they don't have a chance to really settle in and gain their composure. Um, next, have a few sips of water. We recommend that you stay away from a lot of caffeine because if you have already a little bit of a rate, uh, uh, heartbeat rate that's increased or a little bit uh, energized, some caffeine's not going to help you there. Silencing your cell phone, those three are a little bit more obvious. I want to focus on the last three, and that would include please be mindful of your time. I have seen so many occasions, and it really makes me sad, where a previous speaker has hijacked the time of another speaker. As a matter of fact, I have seen speakers at NCA some very recently who didn't even get to present because their time, um, they just didn't have their time. So it's always, always better to come in a little bit under the time frame. Audiences are so much more forgiving of that than going over the time frame. Let your confidence shine and Stephen gave you power posing some and some other great tips there. I'm gonna say it this way, bring your A game. You wanna build your confidence and your credibility but do not forget to have fun. I think sometimes we are so focused and we take what we're doing so seriously as we should, it's important, but don't underestimate the power of fun. It was Ted Sorensen's, uh, he was JFK's speechwriter, and he said, every great presentation should have a combination of clarity, brevity, levity, and charity. And the last, it, meaning it's done with goodwill. So try to enjoy your presentation, all that you have um, taken in your time and your financial resources and your research to get to NCA. You wanna make sure that you're enjoying the experience. And we've talked a lot up to this point about managing the butterflies and certainly we can do more of that privately with you. But as Stephen indicated, you have adrenaline that is flowing through your system, use it to fuel a really great performance, think on the positive, and that glossophobia will really settle for you. We have so many resources, we're gonna to go to the next slide here, and we can suggest just a number of great, great resources, but there is one in particular, it's um, I believe on a later slide, we can just hold here though, it's a wonderful article by the Chronicle 2017, and it's titled Academic Conference Panels Are Boring. And I think if you read that, you're really going to get a sense of perspective, both from the presenter and the audience mindset. So we're going to open this up to Q&A here shortly. But before we do, if it's OK with you folks, I'd like to give a plug to the new NCA, the Blue Ribbon Task Force for Effective Conference Presentations. That's kind of a mouthful. Um, we have, you can see today's webinar. We have some online coaching. We have expert coaches who do this um, full time and they're going to be available. There's no fee. This is our gift to you. And you can set up some personal uh, coaching time. We also have a tremendous pre-conference we're really excited about. This is from 8 a.m. to noon and it is on Wednesday, November 13th. It is titled Talk the Talk and Walk the Walk, the what, why, and how of more effective presentations at the NCA annual convention. And if you're interested in the detail, we are in the Baltimore Convention Center, room 337. So all of that is on our website. Um, again, just a little bit about the Blue Ribbon Task Force. I like to say it this way, who we are, what we do, and why you might care. We are interdivisional inter task force composed of leading members from the Training and Development Division and the National States Advisory Council. I really do wanna give a shout out to the brainchild. This is past chair, uh, Dr. Dennis Becker, and we thank him and all others who are involved. We have a tremendous team of people who are working diligently on this. 
Our mission is right there. We want to identify, really inspire, and encourage best practices for designing and delivering effective conference presentations that communicate the story of research. I want to hold there for a minute. Tell the story, tell the narrative of your research, engage the audience. Um, if you feel awkward about that or you're not really sure how to go about it, please reach out to any of us here or for some coaching because we have some real hard and fast ways that we can help you through that. So as I pass it to Craig, I really want to thank Craig and Stephen for their roles in today's webinar and to all of you um, in joining us today. We hope certainly that you found some relevant value in today's content. We wish you well in your upcoming presentations and your experiences and boy, it'd be really neat for some of you to look us up at NCA. So Craig, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Stephen. Those were excellent presentations on how to give an effective speech of any kind, no less at a, present, uh, at a conference. I know that I personally learned a lot, so I think everybody that showed up here today probably did as well. At this juncture, though, I'd like to offer an opportunity because we do have still minutes remaining in the webinar to ask if any of you present have questions that you would like answered by these uh, top coaches who I'm sure uh, would charge significant amount of money if you were to invite them for a one-on-one -on -one coaching session. So this is your opportunity. And Lisa shared that quotation from the president's Jordan. writer. Yeah, it's great. Clarity, brevity, levity, and charity. Nice figure of speech as well. And if you don't have questions, maybe you have a comment. And also feel free to uh, go ahead and unmute and ask the question with your voice if you, you'd prefer that. Well, well, folks are, are typing or thinking about what they're typing. Um, you know, this has been stated by so many scholars and researchers, but my attribute goes to Tom Antion of the Antion Group. And he talks about the consecutive P's, prior proper preparation prevents poor performance by the person putting on the presentation. And I think, either as undergrads or graduate students, we've probably all been in the circumstance where we maybe studied the night before for an exam or started a paper and did well on it. Uh, you know, that can happen. It's a risk, but it can happen. But generally with presentations, and again, many of you know this, um, especially conference presentations, it, it just doesn't work well. And the audience can often see right through that. So you really do wanna plan, prepare and organize. And again, if there are ways that we can help, please reach out because it would truly be our pleasure. Uh, let's see, what with three points, how much time? Um, I can answer this if it's okay. Sure. There, there is an unwritten rule of thumb, gosh, it was passed down to me in graduate school, where you should have about two to three main points for every 10 minutes of speech. And the beauty is not just in conference presenting, but in the workplace, if a boss or supervisor says, hey, we would like for you to give a 20 minute presentation, you know, boom, that you're gonna have about four to six points. And a lot of that takes the anxiety out of, out of the process. What we know from just observing people and from very credible studies, it's not the actual delivery that generates the, mo the most butterflies, but the preparation. And I got to go see Oprah in her own season, in her last season, and she said, when you know better, you do better. So let's see, uh, read an article recently that you don't wanna seem too smooth to the audience. Okay, well, gosh, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. I, if you can elaborate a little bit. Or and, and let, me, let me add to that one as sure. well. That's an interesting point. This idea that we don't want to have a script, but we do want to have an outline. And I often recommend 
that we think about bullet points as a guide to help move us through the presentation. And that creates that impromptu or authentic nature that I think you're talking about. If you're reading a script or if you've practiced so much that essentially you've memorized it, we tend to go in a monotone and we lose that credibility and authenticity. So I think it's good to practice, but not practice too much because it's okay to riff. In fact, some of the best moments from political and business life have come from riffing. That is those moments when we go off quote unquote script and we allow ourselves to tell a story or engage with our audience more directly. So thank you for bringing that up. Are people sick of PowerPoint slides? Well, Lisa, they can be, and I'll build off of Stephen's comment. Uh, people enjoy the visual component because many audience members, I am a very visual learner. So when I have the spoken word combined with a great visual, that really reinforces my learning. And when I'm working with a client doing executive coaching, I will try to get them to remove all of the text off of the slide, maybe put one picture or one illustration and allow them to tell the story. So as Stephen mentioned, if you have a series of bullet points, let's say you have six, your audience can read. So you might say, here I have six points. For the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna focus on two. And you can always email your slide deck to folks who are interested after the presentation. And I think I misspelled diaphragm, sorry about that. But yes, yeah, standing, um, Lisa, it does open the diaphragm and it really helps that exchange of air. It goes back to what Stephen said about executive presence. In that moment, you are the authority. You are kind of the alpha in sharing your research. I love coaching, leading with visual, focusing on two to six. Wow, you guys are great. Age should complement, right? That is very well stated, right? Presentation aid. Let's see, what else do we have? I prefer slides and find them helpful when they have the right amount of text and visuals, not too cluttered. Yes, very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Stephen, what does that next one say about the article? It says, okay, the article said that being too smooth results in less learning. As more people try to emulate TED Talks, let audience do some, some of the work, some of the thinking work. And that's true. Not all of us are, are giving TED Talks, but all of us are trying to make an impact. And so although TED Talks have become almost ubiquitous, I think the key is to allow ourselves to speak with authenticity. Each of us has a has a unique perspective that we can share and we want that to come through. You know, I often say that you don't need to have a lot of money to make an impact. You just have to have a voice and a big idea. And I think that no matter how that idea gets communicated, whether we're lucky enough to stand on a TED stage or whether we're simply speaking to a group of colleagues, we can use our voice to lead. And I think that's what, what Lisa has emphasized and what this webinar is all about. How can we communicate that sense of leadership to our audience and show them that they can trust us that then that, that they can believe in us and that's the main purpose of a good presentation i'm typing out here someone uh, lisa wanted to know what are some tips to make people hungry for information and it could be um, let me just finish this it could be creativity i think whatever that might look like creates the information hunger. You can start with a really great question, rhetorical question, getting them to think and reflect, um, a unique visual. I really like to begin with what I call micro stories, something that you can impart to create that common ground in a very dynamic way. And it, it creates the, the narrative and the exchange between audience and speaker, really trying to meet their needs. Sometimes I'll just ask audiences, what do you want to know about? Um, I, don't, I don't recommend that approach for NCA, but when I have smaller you know, workshops and other settings and occasions, it really allows me to tailor what I'm doing. But for an NCA presentation, I would start with something that is um, innovative, it's novel, they're hearing something in a new way or a different way, or they're seeing it in a visual that might be unique or informative. You're very welcome. Love those tips. That, that really is a great tip, Lisa, that, this idea of being informative. And I'd also 
like to complement some of the ideas you just shared about PowerPoint by reminding folks of the five by seven rule. In some textbooks, it's referred to as the five by five rule, but I think five by seven rule has, has become a little more realistic nowadays. And what I'm talking about is the idea that you want no more than five, at least for text-based slides, no more than five bullets per slide, and on average, no more than seven words per bullet point. So again, five by seven rule, no more than five bullet points per slide, and no more than, on average, seven words per bullet point. And that makes sure, that ensures rather, that the slides are there to support you, but that you're the star of the show, that people are listening to you, and that you're able to share your ideas appropriately. I also want to remind folks of, a, of an idea, and, and I got this from the McKinsey Mind. This is a great book written by two former McKinsey and company consultants. McKinsey, of course, being the global consulting firm, where they talk about that idea of one idea per slide, one idea per slide. So whether it's a chart, whether it's a graph, or whether it's some text that follows the five by seven rule, we wanna focus on one main idea, one big idea per slide, and that will help ensure that our slides are focused and that our audience understands where we are and where we're going. That's really good advice, Stephen. And that organization will also help build your credibility. And I think that's really what people struggle with. You know, I'm, I'm new or I'm a graduate student and I want to be taken seriously and I want to have some measure of credibility here. Well, what you're going to do and what we're trying to impart here is be dynamic, be enthusiastic. When you're excited about your research, it helps us be excited. So we want to role model the behavior that we want to see in other people. And when you think about being in an audience, consider some of the speaker behaviors that frustrate you, and that might offer some insight into what you don't want to do with your audience. Can I ask Make you, sense? oh, sorry, go ahead, sorry. No, go ahead, done. No, I was going to ask another question that sort of is on, I think deals with the, the presentations today, and that is we've practiced, we've come into the room, and a lot of what you've said assumes a large audience or at least a good size audience, and I know some of us have been at presentations where it ends up being you and maybe the other panelists and one other person in the room that happens to be the friend of someone in, on the panel. So would you all recommend at this juncture, you, how do you adapt or modify in that scenario? Because if I come in and I own the room and I plant my feet, it's going to maybe now make for an awkward situation. So I just thought I'd get your thoughts on that. So do any of you want to comment on that? I'm sure. sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I would just and I'd be interested to hear Lisa's perspective as well as folks who are joining the webinar today. But one thing we might do is walk away from the front of the room, arrange some of the chairs in a circle and and simply go from presenting to having a conversation. I think it's nice we can, of course, adapt something we may have prepared into a much shorter format, whether it's just five minutes each, but trying to engage folks in the conversation. I think getting away from the panel in front of the room and then moving into a circle format signals a willingness that you're real, that you're authentic, and that you're there not just to teach, but to learn and to build authentic connections with listeners. So that's one approach that, that I might recommend. And I apologize, when the question was being asked, my microphone was um, being a little fuzzy and a little um, rough. So I, I would need that question to be repeated, please. Sure, uh, just to summarize, I was just asking how you might adapt when you show up to a, a very small audience at NCA, you know, where it might just be you and a few panelists. Okay, very good. Yeah, I echo Stephen's sentiment. It can be such a rich, an intimate experience. Those, you can probably hear the excitement in my voice because those have been some of the most valuable NCA experiences for me. And what, what has happened, especially in the training and development division, when we have had a number of presenters, um, maybe we had fewer attendees, as Stephen indicated, we will form a big circle. And Stephen, I think we've done this, you've been there and we allow everybody to participate 
and share their thoughts and their impact and their takeaways. And boy, it's just a great conversation. And what's really special about that, it makes it very inclusive, drawing people in rather than setting the tone of I speak and you listen, because we want to get away from the information dump and we want to get more into the realm of telling the story, being enthusiastic, and finding small ways, relevant ways, when, as I said, when it makes sense, when the time is right, and with discernment, to engage the audience, to um, make them part of that presentation. And I certainly have seen very successful speakers, and I've done this a little bit, where I might pause. And I know I'm using some of my time for this at the presentation, but it's beneficial to maybe close with this and ask the audience members to take 30 seconds and, or 45 seconds and talk with a neighbor, you know, talk with somebody seated next to them about what's their big takeaway or how are they thinking differently about the topic. And then you can step in and kind of offer a formal closing as you would with reviewing what's on your mind map, just a quick summary and a quick overview. And it's a nice, sharp way to bring closure and that will help with your credibility as well. Lisa, I, I love that point. And you're really talking about the importance of community. And that's what we're trying to do, build community. I think so often when we teach public speaking, we think about it from a speaker's vantage point, that we're there to communicate ideas. But I often like to say that public speaking is a misnomer. Our goal is not to publicly speak. Our goal is to have a public conversation. And so we want to engage more in public conversation rather than public speaking and to build authentic connections and relationships with the people in the room, because if they like us and they feel we have their best interests at heart, then they're going to be more likely to put our ideas into action, to join a cause, and to mobilize for change. Beautifully stated. Awesome, and at this juncture, just uh, in recognition of time, I want to highlight that I've put the information for this somewhere in the chat, but you can also see this link to the suggested reading. And this will be also made available uh, on the website when we post this webinar, which I'll email everyone that was on the mailing list as well. At this juncture, I think since we talked about building connections, I want to say that the NCA Training and Development Division is open to anybody, regardless of whether or not you are a member of NCA or you are a dues payment member. And when I say open to, in terms of our mailing list, our Facebook pages, and stuff on our website, please feel free to check those things out, join our mailing groups, and become a part of the conversation. Because I do believe our presenters hit that, that connections and conversation is ultimately the goal. And with that in mind, I'd like to say thank you to Stephen and Lisa for giving us excellent presentations. And I'm sure they'd be happy to answer any questions or follow-ups that you might all have but I'll let them have the final word here today. Thank you for everyone for showing up. So Stephen and Lisa, do you have any final words? Well, I'll just say this has truly been our pleasure. We were so excited to bring this to you. Um, we don't claim to have all the answers. We have been at this for a very, very long time. And you know, we, we struggle with our own little um, hiccups in our speaking and presenting because every time is different. But uh, as I said, when you know better, you do better. We are community. We welcome you to join us, talk to us, reach out if we can be of additional assistance. And don't forget to have fun and have some levity while you're at NCA. Well said, Lisa. And hats off to Craig and to all the leadership of the Training and Development Division for their support and, and for making this community as warm and welcoming as it is. Thank you all for coming. Look forward to seeing many of you at NCA. Take care. Bye-bye.